Chapter Eight of Far from the Madding Crowd. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tig Hines. Far from the Madding Crowd by Thomas Hardy. Chapter Eight. The Malt House. The Chat. News. Warren's malt house was enclosed by an old wall enwrapped with ivy, and though not much of the exterior was visible at this hour, the character and purposes of the building were clearly enough shown by its outline upon the sky. From the walls an overhanging thatched roof sloped up to a point in the centre, upon which rose a small wooden lantern, fitted with louver boards on all the four sides, and from these openings a mist was dimly perceived to be escaping into the night air. There was no window in front, but a square hole in the door was glazed with a single pane, through which red comfortable rays now stretched out upon the ivied wall in front. Voices were to be heard inside. Oak's hand skimmed the surface of the door, with fingers extended to an Elemas the sorcerer pattern, till he found a leathern strap which he pulled. This lifted the wooden latch, and the door swung open. The room inside was lighted only by the ruddy glow from the kiln-mouth which shone over the floor with the streaming horizontality of the setting sun, and threw upwards the shadows of all facial irregularities in those assembled around. The stone flag floor was worn into a path from the doorway to the kiln, and into undulations everywhere. A curved settle of unplaned oak stretched along one side, and in a remote corner was a small bed and bedstead the owner and frequent occupier of which was the maltster. This aged man was now sitting opposite the fire, his frosty white hair and beard overgrowing his gnarled figure like the grey moss and lichen upon a leafless apple-tree. He wore breeches and the laced-up shoes called ankle-jacks. He kept his eyes fixed upon the fire. Gabriel's nose was greeted by an atmosphere laden with the sweet smell of new malt. The conversation, which seemed to have been concerning the origin of the fire, immediately ceased, and every one ocularly criticised him to the degree expressed by contracting the flesh of their foreheads and looking at him with narrowed eyelids, as if he had been a light too strong for their sight. Several exclaimed meditatively, after this operation had been completed, "'Ah, oh, tis a new shepherd, I believe. We thought we heard a hand pawing about the door for the bobbin, but weren't sure twere not a dead leaf blowed across.' said another. "'Come in, Shepherd. Sure ye be welcome, though we don't know your name.' "'Gabriel Oak. That's my name, neighbours. The ancient maltster, sitting in the midst, turned at this, his turning being as the turning of a rusty crane. "'That's never Gable Oak's grandson over at Norcombe. Never,' he said, as a formula expressive of surprise, which nobody was supposed for a moment to take literally. "'My father and my grandfather were old men of the name of Gabriel.' said the shepherd, placidly. "'Thought I know the man's face as I see him on the rick. Thought I did. And where be you trade not to now, shepherd?' "'I'm thinking of biding here,' said Mr. Oak. "'Knowed your grandfather for years and years,' continued the maltster, the words coming forth of their own accord, as if the momentum previously imparted had been sufficient. "'Ah, and, and did you?' "'Knowed your grandmother.' "'And her, too?' "'Likewise knowed your father when he was a child. "'Why, my boy Jacob there and your father were sworn brothers. "'That they were, sure. Weren't you, Jacob?' "'Ah, sure,' said his son, a young man about sixty-five, "'with a semi-bald head and one tooth in the left centre of his upper jaw, "'which made much of itself by standing prominent like a milestone in a bank. "'But twas jaw had most to do with him. "'However, my son William must have known the very man afore us.' "'Didn't ye, Billy, afore ye left Norcombe?' "'No, twas Andrew,' said Jacob's son, Billy, a child of forty or thereabouts, who manifested the peculiarity of possessing a cheerful soul in a gloomy body, and whose whiskers were assuming a chinchilla shade here and there. "'Now you can mind Andrew,' said Oak, "'as being a man in the place when I was quite a child. "'Ah, and the other day I and my youngest daughter Liddy were over at my grandson's christening,' continued Billy. We were talking about this very family, and twas only last purification day in this very world, when the use money is get away to the second best poor folk, you know, Shepherd. And I can mind the day, because they all had to traipse up to the vestry. Yeah, this very man's family. Come, Shepherd, and drink. Tis gape and swallow with us. A drop of summer, but not of much account, 
said the maltster, removing from the fire his eyes, which were vermilion red and bleared by gazing into it for so many years. "'Take up the God forgive me, Jacob, and see if tis warm, Jacob.' Jacob stooped to the God forgive me, which was a two-handled tall mug standing in the ashes, cracked and charred with heat. It was rather furred with extraneous matter about the outside, especially in the crevices of the handles, the innermost curves of which may not have seen daylight for several years by reason of this encrustation thereon, formed of ashes accidentally wetted with cider and baked hard. But to the mind of any sensible drinker the cup was no worse for that, being incontestably clean on the inside and about the rim. It may be observed that such a class of mug is called a God forgive me in Weatherbury and its vicinity for uncertain reasons, and probably because its size makes any given toper feel ashamed of himself when he sees its bottom in drinking it empty. Jacob, on receiving the order to see if the liquor was warm enough, placidly dipped his forefinger into it by way of thermometer, and having pronounced it nearly of the proper degree, raised the cup and very civilly attempted to dust some of the ashes from the bottom with the skirt of his smock frock because Shepherd Oak was a stranger. "'A clean cup for the shepherd,' said the maltster commandingly. "'No, not at all,' said Gabriel, in a reproving tone of considerateness. "'I never fuss about dirt in its pure state, and when I know what sort it is.' Taking the mug, he drank an inch or more from the depths of its contents, and duly passed it to the next man. "'Ah! I wouldn't think of giving such trouble to neighbours and washing up when there's so much work to be done in the world already.' continued Oak, in a moister tone, after recovering from the stoppage of breath, which is occasioned by pulls at large mugs. "'A very sensible man,' said Jacob. "'True, true, it can't be gainsaid,' observed a brisk young man, Mark Clark by name, a genial and pleasant gentleman, whom to meet anywhere in your travels was to know, to know was to drink with, and to drink with was, unfortunately, to pay for. "'And here's a mouthful of bread and bacon that Mrs. have sent, Shepherd. "'The cider'll go down better with a bit of victuals. "'Don't ye chalk quite close, Shepherd, "'for I let the bacon fall in the road outside as I was bringing it along, "'and it may be tis rather gritty. "'There tis plain dirt, and we all know what that is, as you say, "'and you bain't a particular man we see, Shepherd. "'True, true, not at all,' said the friendly oak. "'Don't let your teeth quite me, and you won't feel the sandiness at all.' Ha! <laughs> tis wonderful what can be done by contrivance. My own mind exactly, neighbour. Ah, he's his grandfather's own grandson. His grandfather were just such a nice unparticular man, said the maltster. Drink, Henry Frey, drink, magnanimously said Jan Coggan, a person who held St. Simonian notions of share and share alike where liquor was concerned, as the vessel showed signs of approaching him in its gradual revolution among them. Having at this moment reached the end of a wistful gaze into mid-air, Henry did not refuse. He was a man of more than middle age, with eyebrows high up in his forehead, who laid it down that the law of the world was bad, with a long-suffering look through his listeners at the world alluded to, as it presented itself to his imagination. He always signed his name Henry, strenuously insisting upon that spelling, and if any passing schoolmaster ventured to remark that the second E was superfluous and old-fashioned, he received the reply that H-E-N-E-R-Y was the name he was christened, and the name he would stick to, in the tone of one to whom orthographical differences were matters which had a great deal to do with personal character. Mr. Jan Coggan, who had passed the cup to Henry, was a crimson man with a spacious countenance and private glimmer in his eye, whose name had appeared on the marriage register of Weatherbury and the neighbouring parishes as best man and chief witness in countless unions of the previous twenty years. He also very frequently filled the post of head godfather in baptisms of the subtly jovial kind. "'Come, Mark Clark, come, there's plenty more in the barrel,' said Jan. "'Ah, that I will. Tis my only doctor.' replied Mr. Clark, who, twenty years younger than Jan Coggan, revolved in the same orbit. He secreted mirth on all occasions for special discharge at popular parties. "'Why, Joseph Poorgrass, ye hadn't had a drop,' said Mr. Coggan to a self-conscious man in the background, thrusting the cup towards him. "'Such a modest man as he is,' said Jacob Smallbury. "'Why, you've hardly had strength of eye enough to look on our young missus's face, so I hear, Joseph.' All looked at Joseph Poorgrass with pitying reproach. "'No, I've hardly looked at her at all,' 
simpered Joseph, reducing his body smaller whilst talking, apparently from a meek sense of undue prominence. "'And when I see her, twas nothing but blushes with me.' "'Poor feller,' said Mr. Clark. "'Tis a curious nature for a man,' said Jan Coggan. "'Yes,' continued Joseph Poorgrass, his shyness, which was so painful as it effect, filling him with a mild complacency, now that it was regarded as an interesting study. "'Twar blush, blush, blush would be every minute of the time when she was speaking to me.' "'I believe you, Joseph Poorgrass, for we all know you to be a very bashful man.' "'Tis an awkward gift for a man, poor soul,' said the maltster. "'And how long have you suffered from it, Joseph?' "'Ah, oh, ever since I was a boy. Yes, mother was concerned to her heart about it, yes, but twas all not. "'Did you ever go into the world and try to stop it, Joseph Poorgrass?' "'I tried all sorts of company. They took me to Greenhill Fair, and into a great gay Jerry go nimble show, where there were women folk riding around, standing upon horses, with hardly anything on but their smocks, but that didn't cure me a morsel. And then I was put errand man at the woman's skittle alley at the back of the tailor's arms in Carcerbridge. It was a horrible, sinful situation, and a very curious place for a good man. I had to stand and look body people in the face from morning till night. But twas no use. I was just as bad as ever after all. Blushes have been in the family for generations. There, tis a happy providence that I be no worse. True, said Jacob Smallbury, deepening his thoughts to a profounder view of the subject. Tis a thought to look at that ye might have been worse. But even as ye be, tis a very bad affliction for ye, Joseph. For ye see, Shepherd, though tis very well for a woman, dang it all, tis awkward for a man like him, poor fella. Yeah, it is, tis, said Gabriel, recovering from a meditation. Yes, very awkward for the man. Aye, and he's very timid too, observed Jan Coggan. Once he had been working late at Yalbury Bottom, and had had a drop of drink, and lost his way as he was coming home along through Yalbury Wood. Didn't he, Master Poorgrass? No, 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 not that story, expostulated the modest man, forcing a laugh to bury his concern. And so a lost himself quite continued Mr. Coggan with an impassive face, implying that a true narrative, like time and tide, must run its course, and would respect no man. And as he was coming along in the middle of the night, much afeard and not able to find his way out of the trees no how, a cried out, "'Man a-lost! Man a-lost!' A owl in a tree happened to be crying, "'Who! Who! Who! As owls do, you know, shepherd. Gabriel nodded. And Joseph, all in a tremble, said, "'Joseph Poorgrass of Weatherby, sir!' "'No, no, now that's too much,' said the timid man, becoming a man of brazen courage all of a sudden. "'I didn't say, sir. I'll take my oath I didn't say, Joseph Poorgrass of Weatherby, sir. No, no, what's right is right, and I never said sir to the board, knowing very well that no man of a gentleman's rank would be hollering there at that time of night. Joseph Poorgrass of Weatherby, that's every word I said, and I shouldn't have said that if I hadn't have been for Keeper Day's metheglin. There, twas a merciful thing it ended where it did. The question of which was right being tacitly waived by the company, Jan went on meditatively. And he's a fearfulest man, ain't you, Joseph? Ah, another time you were lost by lambing down gate, weren't you, Joseph? Ah, I was, replied poor Grass as if there were some conditions too serious even for modesty to remember itself under, this being one. "'Yes, that were in the middle of the night, too. The gate would not open, try how he would, and knowing there was the devil's hand in it, he kneeled down.' "'Ah!' said Joseph, acquiring confidence from the warmth of the fire, the cider, and a perception of the narrative capabilities of the experience alluded to. "'My heart died within me that time, but I kneeled down and said the Lord's Prayer.' and then the belief right through, and then the Ten Commandments in earnest prayer. But no, the gate wouldn't open. And then I went on with dearly beloved brethren, and thinks I, this makes four, and tis all I know out of the book, and if this don't do it, nothing will, and I'm a lost man. Well, when I got to saying after me, I rose from my knees and found that the gate would open. Yes, neighbours, the gate opened the same as ever. A meditation on the obvious inference was indulged in by all, and during its continuance each directed his vision into the ash-pit, which glowed like a desert in the tropics under a vertical sun, shaping their eyes long and liney, partly because of the light, 
partly from the depth of the subject discussed. Gabriel broke the silence. "'What sort of place is this to live at, uh, and what sort of missus is she to work under?' Gabriel's bosom thrilled gently as he thus slipped under the notice of the assembly, the innermost subject of his heart. "'We did no little of her, nothing. She only showed herself a few days ago. Her uncle was took bad, and the doctor was called with his world-wide skill, but he couldn't save the man. As I take it, she's going to keep on the farm.' "'That's about the shape of it, I believe.' said Jan Coggan. Ah, tis a very good family. I'd as soon be under em as under one ear and there. Her uncle was a very fair sort of man. Did you know in Shepherd, a bachelor man? Not at all. I used to go to his house, according my first wife, Charlotte, who was his dairymaid. Well, a very good-hearted man were Farmer Everdeen, and I, being a respectable young fellow, was allowed to call and see her, and drink as much ale as I liked, but not to carry away any. Yeah, outside of my skin, I mean, of course. Ah, ah, Jan Coggan, we know your meaning. And, you see, t'was beautiful ale, and I wished to value his kindness as much as I could, and not to be so ill-mannered as to drink only a thimbleful, which would have been insulting to the man's generosity. True, Master Coggan, t'would so, corroborated Mark Clark. And so I used to eat a lot of salt fish afore going, and then by the time I got there I were as dry as a lime-basket. So thoroughly dry that that ale would slip down. Ah, <laughs> twould slip down sweet. Happy times, heavenly times. Such lovely drunks as I used to have at that house. You can mind, Jacob. You used to go with me sometimes. I can, I can, said Jacob. That one too that we had at the book's head on a white Monday was a pretty tipple. Twas, but for a wet of the better class, that brought you no nearer to the horned man than you were before you begun, there was none like those in Farmer Everdeen's kitchen. Not a single dam allowed. No, not a bare poor one, even at the most cheerful moment when all were blindest. Though the good old word of sin thrown in here and there at such times is a great relief to a merry soul. True, said the maltster. Nature requires her swearing at regular times, or she's not herself, and unholy exclamations is a necessity of life. But Charlotte, continued Coggan, not a word of the sort would Charlotte allow, nor the smallest item of taken in vain. Ah, poor Charlotte. I wonder if she'd had the good fortune to get into heaven when I died. But I never was much in luck's way, and perhaps I went downwards after all, poor soul. And did any of you know Miss Everdeen's father and mother? inquired the shepherd, who found some difficulty in keeping the conversation in the desired channel. I knew him a little said Jacob Smallbury. But they were townsfolk and didn't live here. They've been dead for years. Father, what sort of people were Mrs.'s father and mother? Well, said the maltster, he wasn't much to look at, but she was a lovely woman. He was fond enough of her as a sweetheart. He used to kiss her scores and long unders at times, so twas said, observed Coggan. He was very proud of her, too, when they were married, as I've been told, said the maltster. Ah, said Coggan, he admired her so much that he used to light the candle three times a night to look at her. Boundless love! I shouldn't have supposed it in the universe, murmured Joseph Poorgrass, who habitually spoke on a large scale in his moral reflections. Well, to be sure, said Gabriel. Ah, oh, tis true enough. I know the man and woman both well. Levi Everdeen, that was the man's name, sure. Man, say it I in my hurry, but he were of a higher circle of life than that. It was a gentleman tailor, really, worth scores of pounds, and he became a very celebrated bankrupt two or three times. Oh, I thought he was quite a common man, said Joseph. Oh, no, no, that man failed for heaps of money, hundreds in gold and silver. The maltster being rather short of breath, Mr. Coggan, after absently scrutinising a coal which had fallen among the ashes, took up the narrative with a private twirl of his eye. "'Well, now, you'd hardly believe it, but that man, our Miss Everdeen's father, was one of the ficklest husbands alive, after a while. Understand, I didn't want to be fickle, but he couldn't help it. The poor fellow were faithful and true enough to her in his wish, but his heart would rove, do what he would. He spoke to me in real tribulation about it once. Coggan, he said, I could never wish for a handsomer woman than I've got. But feeling she's ticketed as my lawful wife, I can't help my wicked heart wandering, 
do what I will. But, alas, I believe he cured her by making her take off her wedding ring, and calling her by her maiden name, as they sat together after the shop was shut, and so I would get to fancy she was only a sweetheart and not married to him at all. And as soon as he could thoroughly fancy he was doing wrong, and committing the seventh, I got to like her as well as ever, and they lived on a perfect picture of mutual love. Well, that was a most ungodly remedy murmured Joseph Poorgrass, but we ought to feel deep cheerfulness that a happy providence kept it from being any worse. You see, he might have gone the bad road, and given his eyes to unlawfulness entirely. Yes, gross unlawfulness, so to say it. You see, said Bill Smallbury, the man's will was to do right, sure enough, but his heart didn't chime in. He got so much better that he was quite godly in his later years, wasn't he, Jan? said Joseph Poorgrass. He got himself confirmed over again in a more serious way, and took to saying Amen almost as loud as the clerk, and he liked to copy comforting verses from the tombstones. He used to to hold the money play at Let Your Light So Shine, and Stand Godfather to poor little come by chance children. And he kept a missionary box on his table, <laughs> to nab folks unawares when they called. Yeah, and he would box the charity boys' ears, if they laughed in church, till they could hardly stand upright, and do other deeds of piety natural to the saintly inclined. Aye, and at that time he thought of nothing but high things, added Billy Smallbury. One day Parson Thirdly met him and said, Good morning, Mr. Everdeen, tis a fine day. Amen, said Everdeen, quite absent-like, thinking only of religion when he see the parson. Yeah, he was a very Christian man. Their daughter was not at all a pretty child at that time, said Henry Frey. Never should have thought she'd have growed up such a handsome body as she is. Tis to be hoped her temper's as good as her face. Well, yes, but the bailey'll have most to do with the business than ourselves. Ah, Henry gazed in the ash pit and smiled volumes of ironical knowledge. A queer Christian, like a devil's head in a cowl, as the saying is, volunteered Mark Clark. Footnote. This phrase is a conjectural emendation of the unintelligible expression, as the devil said to the owl, used by the natives. End of footnote. He is, said Henry, implying that irony must cease at a certain point. Between we two, man and man, I believe that man would as soon tell a lie on Sundays as working days. That I do. Good faith, you do talk, said Gabriel. It's true enough said the man of bitter moods, looking round upon the company with the antithetic laughter that comes from a keener appreciation of the miseries of life than ordinary men are capable of. Ha! <laughs> There's the people of one sort and people of another, but that man, bless your souls. Gabriel thought fit to change the subject. You must be a very aged man, Malter, to have sons growed mild and ancient, he remarked. Father's so old that I can't mind his age, can he, father? interposed Jacob, and he's grown terrible crooked too lately. Jacob continued, surveying his father's figure, which was rather more bowed than his own. Really, one may say the father there is three-double. Crooked folk will last a long while, said the master, grimly, and not in the best humour. Shepherd would like to hear the pedigree of your life, father, wouldn't you, Shepherd? Aye, that I should, said Gabriel, with the heartiness of a man who had longed to hear it for several months. "'What may your age be, Mulder? The maltster cleared his throat in an exaggerated form for emphasis, and, elongating his gaze to the remotest point of the ash-pit, said in the slow speech justifiable when the importance of a subject is so generally felt that any mannerism must be tolerated in getting at it. "'Well, we don't mind the year I were born in, but perhaps I can reckon up the places I've lived at, and so get it that way. I bowed at Upper Long Puddle across there, nodding to the north, till I were eleven, bowed seven at King's Beer, nodding to the east, where I took to malting. I went therefrom to Norcombe, and malted there two and twenty years, and two and twenty years I was there turnipoing and harvesting. Ah, I know that old place Norcombe years afore you were thought of, Master Oak. Oak smiled sincere belief in the fact. Then I malted at Dornover four years, and four-year Tornopoen, and I was fourteen times eleven months at Millpond St. Jude's, nodding north-west by north. Old Twills wouldn't hire me for more than eleven months at a time to keep me from being chargeable to the parish, if so be I was disabled. 
Then I was three years at Melstock, and I've been here one and thirty year come Candlemas. Now how much is that? Hundred and seventeen, chuckled another old gentleman given to mental arithmetic and little conversation, who had hitherto sat unobserved in a corner. Well, then, that's my age, said the maltster emphatically. <laughs> oh, no, father, said Jacob. Your turnip owen were in the summer and your malton in the winter of the same years, and we don't ought to count both halves, father. Chock it all. I lived through the summers, didn't I? That's my question. I suppose you'll say next there'll be no age at all to speak of. Sure we shan't, said Gabriel soothingly. You be a very old age person, Malter, attested Jan Coggan, also soothingly. We all know that, and you must have a wonderful talented constitution to be able to live so long, mustn't he, neighbours? True, true, you must, Malter, wonderful, said the meeting unanimously. The maltster, being now pacified, was even generous enough to voluntarily disparage in a slight degree the virtue of having lived a great many years, by mentioning that the cup they were drinking out of was three years older than he. While the cup was being examined, the end of Gabriel Oak's flute became visible over his smock-frock pocket, and Henry Frey exclaimed, "'Surely, Shepherd, I see you blowing into a great flute by now at Casterbridge.' "'You did?' said Gabriel, blushing faintly. I've been in great trouble, neighbours, and was driven to it. I used not to be so poor as I be now. Never mind, heart, said Mark Clark. You should take a careless like shepherd, and your time will come. But we could thank you for a tune, if ye bain't too tired. Neither drum nor trumpet of air since Christmas, said Jan Coggan. Come, raise a tune, Master Oak. Ah, that I will, said Gabriel, pulling out his flute and putting it together. A poor tool, neighbours, but such as I can do ye shall have and welcome. Oak then struck up Jockey to the fair, and played that sparkling melody three times through, accenting the notes in the third round in a most artistic and lively manner by bending his body in small jerks and tapping with his foot to beat time. "'He can blow the flute very well, that I can,' said a young married man who, having no individuality worth mentioning, was known as Susan Tall's husband. He continued, "'I'd as leaf as not be able to blow a flute as well as that.' "'He's a clever man, and tis true comfort for us to have such a shepherd,' murmured Joseph Poorgrass in a soft cadence. "'We ought to feel full of thanksgiving that he's not a player of bawdy songs instead of these merry tunes, for it would have been just as easy for God to have made the shepherd a loose, low man, a man of iniquity, so to speak, as what he is.' "'Yes, for our wives and daughters' sakes, we should feel real thanksgiving.' "'True, true, real thanksgiving,' dashed in Mark Clark conclusively, not feeling it to be of any consequence to his opinion that he had only heard about a word and three-quarters of what Joseph had said. "'Yes,' added Joseph, beginning to feel like a man in the Bible, "'for evil do thrive so in these times, that ye may be as much deceived in the cleanest shaved and whitest shortest man as in the raggedest tramp on the turnpike.' if I may term it so. "'Ah, I can mind your face now, shepherd," said Henry Frey, criticising Gabriel with misty eyes as he entered upon his second tune. "'Yes, now I see ye blown into the flue, I know ye to be the same man I see playing at Casterbridge, for your mouth were scrimped up and your eyes are staring out like a strangle man's, just as they be now. "'Tis a pity that playing the flue should make a man look such a scarecrow observed Mr. Mark Clark, with additional criticism of Gabriel's countenance, the latter person jerking out, with the ghastly grimace required by the instrument, the chorus of Dame Durden. "'Twas Moll and Beth and Doll and Kate, and Dorothy Draggletail. "'I hope you don't mind that young man's bad manners in naming your features,' whispered Joseph to Gabriel. "'Not at all,' said Mr. Oak. "'For by nature ye be a very handsome man, shepherd continued Joseph Poorgrass, with winning suavity. "'Ah, that you be, shepherd," said the company. "'Thank you very much,' said Oak, in the modest tone good manners demanded, thinking, however, that he would never let Bathsheba see him playing the flute. In this resolve, showing a discretion equal to that related to its sagacious inventress, the divine Minerva herself. "'Ah, when I and my wife were married at Norkham Church,' said the old maltster, not pleased at finding himself left out of the subject. We were called the handsomest couple in the neighbourhood. Everybody said so. Danged if you bain't all her now, Malder, 
said a voice with a vigour natural to the enunciation of a remarkably evident truism. It came from the old man in the background, whose offensiveness and spiteful ways were barely atoned for by the occasional chuckle he contributed to general laughs. "'Oh, no, no,' said Gabriel. "'Don't you play no more, shepherd," said Susan Tall's husband, the young married man who had spoken once before. "'I must be moving, and when there's tunes going on I seem as if hung on wires. If I thought after I'd left that music was still playing, and I not there, I should be quite melancholy-like.' "'What's your hurry, then, Laban?' inquired Coggan. "'You used to bide as late as the latest.' "'Well, you see, neighbours, I was lately married to a woman, and she's my vocation now, and so you see—' The young man halted lamely. "'New lords, new laws, as the saying is, I suppose,' remarked Coggan. "'Ah, I believe,' ha, <laughs> said Susan Tall's husband, in a tone intended to imply his habitual reception of jokes, without minding them at all. The young man then wished him good-night and withdrew. Henry Frey was the first to follow. Then Gabriel arose and went off with Jan Coggan, who had offered him a lodging. A few minutes later, when the remaining ones were on their legs and about to depart, Frey came back again in a hurry. Flourishing his finger ominously, he threw a gaze teeming with tidings, just where his eye alighted by accident, which happened to be in Joseph Poorgrass's face. "'Oh, what's the matter? What's the matter, Henry?' said Joseph, starting back. "'What's a brewin' Henry?' asked Jacob and Mark Clark. "'Bailey Pennyways! Bailey Pennyways! I said so! Yes, I said so!' "'What? Found out stealing anything?' "'Stealing it is. The news is that after Miss Everdeen got home she went out again to see all was safe, as she usually do, and coming in found Bailey Pennyways creeping down the granary steps with half a bushel of barley. She fleed at him like a cat. Never such a tomboy as she is. Of course, I speak with closed doors. You do, you do, Henry. She fleed at him, and to cut a long story short, he owned to having carried off five sack altogether, upon our promise not to prosecute him. Well, he's turned out neck and crop, and my question is, who's going to be Bailey now? The question was such a profound one that Henry was obliged to drink there and then from the large cup till the bottom was distinctly visible inside. Before he had replaced it on the table, in came the young man, Susan Tall's husband, in a still greater hurry. "'Have you heard the news that's all over parish?' "'About Bailey Pennyways?' Uh, "'But besides that—' "'No, not a morsel of it,' they replied, looking into the very midst of Laban Tall, as if to meet his words half-way down his throat. "'What a night of horrors!' murmured Joseph Poorgrass, waving his hand spasmodically. I've had the news bell ringing in my left ear quite bad enough for a murder, and I've seen a magpie all alone. Fanny Robin, Miss Everdeen's youngest servant, can't be found. They've been wanting to lock up the doors these two hours, but she isn't come in, and they don't know what to do about going to bed for fear of locking her out. They wouldn't be so concerned if she hadn't been noticed in such low spirits these last few days. And Mary Ann to think the beginning of a crowner's inquest has happened to the poor girl. "'Ah, oh, tis burned, tis burned,' came from Joseph Poorgrass's dry lips. "'No, tis drowned,' said Tall. "'Or oh, tis her father's razor,' suggested Bill Smallbury, with a vivid sense of detail. "'Well, Miss Everdeen wants to speak to one or two of us before we go to bed. "'What with this trouble about the bailey, and now about the girl, Mrs. is almost wild.' They all hastened up the lane to the farmhouse, excepting the old maltster, whom neither news, fire, rain, nor thunder could draw from his hole. There, as the other's footsteps died away, he sat down again, and continued gazing as usual into the furnace, with his red, bleared eyes. From the bedroom window above their heads, Bathsheba's head and shoulders, robed in mystic white, were dimly seen extended into the air. "'Are any of my men among you?' she said anxiously. "'Yes, ma'am, several,' said Susan Tall's husband. "'Tomorrow morning I wish two or three of you to make inquiries in the villages round, if they have seen such a person as Fanny Robin. Do it quietly. There's no reason for alarm as yet. She must have left whilst we were all at the fire.' "'Beg your pardon, but had she any young man courting her in the parish, ma'am?' asked Jacob Smallbury. "'I don't know,' said Bathsheba. "'I never heard any such thing, ma'am,' said two or three. "'It is hardly likely either.' continued Bathsheba, for any lover of hers might have come to the house if he had been a respectable lad. 
The most mysterious matter connected with her absence, indeed the only thing which gives me serious alarm, is that she was seen to go out of the house by Mary Ann, with only her indoor working gown on, and not even a bonnet. "'And you mean, ma'am, excusing my words, that a young woman would hardly go to see a young man without dressing up,' said Jacob, turning his mental vision upon past experiences. "'That's true. She would not, ma'am.' "'She had, I think, a bundle, though I couldn't see very well.' said a female voice from another window, which seemed that of Mary Ann. But she had no young man about here. Hers lives in Casterbridge, and I believe he's a soldier. Do you know his name? Bathsheba said. No, mistress, she was very close about it. Perhaps I might be able to find out if I went to Casterbridge Barracks, said William Smallbury. Very well. If she doesn't return to-morrow, mind you go there and try to discover which man it is, and see him. I feel more responsible than I should if she had had any friends or relations alive. I do hope she has come to no harm through a man of that kind. And then there's this disgraceful affair of the bailiff, but I can't speak of him now. Bathsheba had so many reasons for uneasiness that it seemed she did not think it worth while to dwell upon any particular one. Do as I told you, then, she said in conclusion, closing the casement. Aye, aye, missus, we will, they replied and moved away. That night at Coggins, Gabriel Oak, beneath the screen of closed eyelids, was busy with fancies, and full of movement, like a river flowing rapidly under its ice. Night had always been the time at which he saw Bathsheba most vividly, and through the slow hours of shadow he tenderly regarded her image now. It is rarely that the pleasures of the imagination will compensate for their pain of sleeplessness, but they possibly did with Oak to-night. For the delight of merely seeing her effaced for the time his perception of the great difference between seeing and possessing. He also thought of plans for fetching his few utensils and books from Norcombe. The young man's best companion, the farrier's sure guide, the veterinary surgeon, Paradise Lost, the Pilgrim's Progress, Robinson Crusoe, Ash's Dictionary, and Wilkingame's Arithmetic constituted his library and though a limited series, it was one from which he had acquired more sound information by diligent perusal than many a man of opportunities has done from a furlong of laden shelves. End of chapter 8